Pentiment is a narrative-focused, adventure role-playing game set in 16th century Bavaria. Following the life of journeyman artist Andreas Mailer and his time in the small town of Tassing. At the beginning of the game, Andreas is serving an apprenticeship as a manuscript illuminator at Kearsau Abbey. One day, an influential baron comes to town to check on the progress of a manuscript he commissioned, only to be met with hostile interactions from much of the townsfolk. It becomes clear that the baron is not a good man, nor is he well liked and it doesn't help that he seems to be holding a secret about the town that others might not want to be shared. Despite this, the Baron is an important benefactor of Kearsau Abbey, and it is through commissioned manuscripts that the Abbey is able to stay running. The day after the Baron arrives, however, he's found murdered in the chapter house of the Abbey. Abbot Gernot, who fears that the murder will damage the Abbey's reputation, accuses Andreas' longtime friend and mentor, Brother Piero, of the murder, and imprisons him until the Archdeacon can conduct an inquiry, much to Andreas' protests. Seeking justice, Andreas conducts an investigation of his own, and it is here where the core of the game is unveiled. Andreas is allowed to gather as much information as possible within a constricted time limit, but because of the game's nature and setting, Andreas can only deduce and accuse suspects based upon limited circumstantial evidence and motives. This gives Andreas a choice. With the information he has, who does he think did the murder? Or, more disturbingly, based on his judgment, who does he think deserves punishment? Pentiment never outright tells you who the murderer of the Baron is. Though, the end of the game does reveal who the so-called Thread Puller is, a behind-the-scenes mastermind who influences some of the townsfolk to kill others. Because it isn't just the Baron's murder that the game follows. The story of Pentiment takes place in three acts spanning 25 years, following different crimes, conspiracies, and murder plots that Andreas and the townspeople set out to solve all of which connect to the town's lasting mystery. Who killed Baron Lorenz Rothvogel? And why? Before I continue, I'd like to mention that there will be some fairly major spoilers in this video, so if you'd like to experience Pentiment for yourself, please come back to this video at a later date. Oddly enough, however, it isn't really the murder mystery of this game that I want to talk about today. Don't get me wrong, it's a compelling, satisfying mystery that's filled with some absolutely shocking twists. But to me, it isn't the murder mystery itself that makes this game as intriguing and well done as it is. It's the underlying themes that make it that way. So, for this video, I'm gonna be looking at Pentiment through the lens of how it's engaging, complex story, town, and characters are shaped by the social cultural conditions of their time. Because Pentiment is more than just its mystery. Pentiment is ultimately a story about people who are unhappy about their lot in life, whether that's men, women, nuns, priests, husbands, wives, peasants, or even aristocrats. Their unhappiness, and consequently, the violence and unrest resulting from this unhappiness explains the sweeping changes in culture and religion that characterizes the history this game is based off of. And the reason for this unhappiness centers primarily on the idea of control. Who has it, who doesn't have it, and what those with control decide to do with that sheer power and responsibility. And that includes the player on a very meta level. The choice-based nature of the game is a literal mechanism of control handed to the player, and you are included in this game's hierarchy of power, as seen in your ability to execute whomever you deem guilty of a crime. Of course, Pentiment isn't just about this floating idea or general concept of control. The word control could refer to anything. Control of resources, control of beliefs, control of your actions, control of your own livelihood and fate, 
control of just about anything. And while Pentiment's story features all of these things, there is one very specific aspect of control that concerns Pentiment's story more than anything else. And that is the notion of narrative control. Examining narrative control is key to understanding Pentiment's themes. Narrative control is at the epicenter of everything that happens in this video game, right down to the resolution of the murder mystery itself. Because embedded within Pentiment's story is the idea of just how important it is to control the narrative. Because those who have control over the narrative are able to dictate the truth. And what that supposed truth is, decides the fate of all those involved in the story, whether those people like it or not. I know I might be sounding a little vague here, so when I say the term narrative control, I mean multiple things in the context of this game. There are several layers to how narrative control is presented in Pentiment, whether that's through your own choices as a player, or through actual moments in the story itself. I want to show you just how intricate the game is designed around the idea of narrative control. So I'll be breaking down each of these layers in this section of the video. I'm going to peel them back like an onion, digging deeper and deeper until we identify every single notion of narrative control in this game. Let's start with layer 0, which I'd like to call the contextual layer. And by this, I particularly mean the context through which we are meant to view the game through. This is like the skin of the game. The part that holds everything together. The part that you see first. Before you even begin the game, you can learn so much about it just by examining its title. The word pentiment derives from the artistic Italian term pentimento which has a dual meaning in reality just as much as it does in this game. The first meaning is a direct translation. Pentimento is Italian for the word repentance, which, in the context of pentiment, is highly applicable, as the game is showered in religious overtones and the notion of sin, crime, and remorse is a heavy part of the game's story. But the more pertinent meaning of pentimento in this case is in its other definition. The presence or emergence of earlier forms, images, or strokes that have been changed and painted over. For example, in a composition, an artist may have changed one of the elements of the painting during the process. And therefore, a head or a hand may be in a slightly different place in the final painting but traces of those original elements still remain. And this is exactly what narrative control is all about. In the same way you might modify, shape, or paint over certain elements in a painting, you might rewrite, retell, or embellish a story, changing how that story is immortalized in history. At the beginning of the game, Brother Piero offers Andrea some advice about his art, stating, Art is illusion, storytelling, but in their most sublime form, these images illuminate a path to truth. What will it say to those who see it in a future generation, centuries beyond our comprehension? Some will gaze deep into your lines and paint to seek a deeper meaning. What will they find? And that's why the term pentiment is central to understanding the theme of this game. We must look at history with the lens of how narrative control has twisted, influenced, and changed how we view the events of the past. But we must also understand that under scrutiny, original traces of the past still remain. Not only that, but the observer has a role in narrative control too. How we look into and interpret the past is also a factor of narrative control. Just like Brother Piero says, what will a future generation see when they look at your art? What will they find when they dig deep and analyze what it says? 
That's exactly what I'm doing with this video. As an outside observer, I'm putting forth my personal perspective on this story, thus involving myself in the narrative control of Pentiment. And that's the layer through which we should view this game. Understanding that narrative control is central to Pentiment's themes and story. That is how the game presents itself. That is layer zero, the skin of Pentiment. So, let's peel back that skin to reveal another layer of narrative control, which I'd like to call layer one, the meta layer. I call this layer the meta layer specifically because of how the game appears to point out its mechanisms of narrative control to you. It's often blatant about conveying just how much this game is centered on narrative control, and it wants you to know it. It wants you to know that it's self-aware. For example, I had mentioned earlier that the choice-based nature of the game is a literal mechanism of control handed to the player and the sheer power you have and who you choose to punish for murder points out just how much narrative control you have over the lives of the people in Tassing. Obviously, the game has its limitations on how much you can affect the story, but I mention this aspect of narrative control because again, the game is embedded with all sorts of notions of narrative control. Every choice you make is a constant reminder of that pervasive theme. And, to go even further than that, the game presents itself almost like a written history. Dialogue is represented by stylistic fonts that are constantly being redacted, changed, edited, and fixed. This feature makes it feel like someone is controlling the narrative in some way, whether that's you with your choices, or some unnamed historian writing or fixing the story as it goes perhaps even with purposeful inaccuracies. So let's go one layer further then. What, exactly, is in the contents of that written chronicle? Let's move on to layer two, the story layer. In this layer, I'd like to address direct narrative elements that concern narrative control. What happens in this story? And what parts of it have to do with narrative control? I'm not going to go over an entire plot summary of what happens in Pentiment, but I'd like to at least give a little bit more context so everything I say at least makes some sense. As I said earlier in the video, the story centers around several murders that happen in the town of Tassing, but why these individuals are murdered is unclear until the very end of the game. Multiple town members have various motives for why they would kill their fellow neighbor. For example, one suspect in the Baron Lawrence Rothvogel case is a priest that Andreas finds out has been secretly interested in performing dark, pagan rituals, a fact that the Baron knew and might have exploited against him. In a different example, a peasant named Otto gets murdered after rallying the town against the abbot's unfair treatment of the peasants. Right before he's slated to reveal a secret miracle to the townsfolk that he's certain will inspire them to seek justice. One of the suspects in that case is an innkeeper named Hannah, who a witness claims had been frequently visiting the murder site days before the murder happened. This might have been her inspecting the site for a convenient way to kill him. Not only that, but Andreas overhears her saying that she's glad that Otto died because his uprising would have threatened business for her in. The reason why she believes this is because Andreas discovers that she was given a note from someone, and the note insinuates that Otto was planning on destroying the abbey and the hand of St. Moritz, which is a part of a religious statue that draws pilgrimages to the town. But this note is not a singular clue unique to Hannah. From the very first murder, Andreas discovers variations of these notes delivered to each suspect. And in each of these notes, the suspect is threatened by an unknown individual, letting them know that their secret is known. Andreas postulates that each and every one of the murders is committed by what he describes as a thread puller. In other words, someone who's causing the townsfolk to turn on someone else by threatening to reveal their secrets. 
The term thread puller is a very deliberate one. It brings forth imagery of a puppet master, someone who's controlling other people, someone who's controlling the narrative. Before I reveal who that thread puller is, I'd like to return to the story of Otto. Why was he targeted by the thread puller specifically? His death, along with all the other murders, explains exactly why narrative control is so important to the thread puller. As I mentioned before, Otto tells Andreas that he's going to reveal a secret miracle to the townsfolk to inspire them to revolt against the abbot. And what that miracle is, has everything to do with his death. Otto claims to have found the head of the statue of St. Moritz, the Christian saint that this town's faith was based upon. Because Otto is an illiterate peasant, he was unable to read an inscription upon the statue's head. Mars, the Roman god of war. This meant that there wasn't a St. Moritz after all, and the hand of St. Moritz that pilgrims came from all over the region to see is actually the hand of a Roman god. The Baron Lawrence Rothvogel's death resulted from a similar discovery. He had come to the town to donate a rare copy of a history book that revealed that the town's two Christian saints, Moritz and Satya, were reinterpretations of the Roman gods Mars and Diana. And underneath the town lies an ancient abandoned Mithraeum, where a temple of Roman ruins reveals the true origins of the town's Christian saints. The town's history and faith is not at all based upon Christianity then. It is instead based upon heretical, pagan gods. And there's one man in the town who refused to let this be known. It's revealed that the thread puller was none other than Father Thomas, the town priest. He tells Andreas that he hid the truth of the town's history in order to preserve the faith of the town's citizens. If they had figured out the truth of Moritz and Satya's origins, their faith would be crushed and challenged, and perhaps they wouldn't be Christians anymore. He commits the ultimate act of narrative control in the story. By purposefully concealing the origins of the town's saints by any means necessary, he controls the faith of the townsfolk. And that isn't the only act of narrative control he commits. As the thread puller, Father Thomas controls the townsfolk to murder those who were close to revealing the secret of St. Moritz. And the way he did that was by abusing the seal of confession. As the town priest, the townsfolk would come to him to confess their sins, and he would weaponize those stories against them in his malevolent accusatory notes. Father Thomas ends up controlling their narratives too. By exploiting their deepest, darkest secrets, he is able to convince some of them to commit murder, changing the course of their lives forever. But, contrary to his pivotal role in the story, Father Thomas is not actually the person who wields the most narrative control in Pentiment. That title instead belongs to Magdalene, the young daughter of the town printer and the main character of the third act of the game. After her father is targeted and almost fatally wounded by the thread puller, she takes over his job to paint a historical mural in the newly constructed town hall. Magdalene is a talented artist just like her father, and she sets out to make a three-part mural in the town hall that depicts three distinct eras of Tassing, its pagan roots, its early Christian days, and finally, its contemporary history. This is why Magdalene holds the most narrative control in Pentiment. The choices she ultimately makes for her mural immortalizes those choices for the next generation of people who come here to learn about the town's history, as historians will look upon it as Tassing's truth. It's Magdalene's choice on whether or not she wants to preserve Father Thomas's lie, or if she wants to reveal Tassing's heretical pagan origins. This choice is crucial to the lives of everyone in Tassing. However it is that Magdalene wants to portray Tassing though, such as depicting Otto's disastrous failed revolt against the abbot, 
One thing is for sure, narrative control doesn't end here. History is constantly rewritten by each consecutive community that comes after the previous one. History is never like the lived experience of those who came beforehand. The original settlers of Tassing repurposed pagan gods into Christian saints. And how people see those Christian saints will undoubtedly change as well, as seen by Baron Lorenz Rothvogel's insistence on discussing Martin Luther's newly written 95 Theses. By the end of the game, the people of Tassing have rewritten their own history, as did those who came before them. Magdalene's critical choices for her mural, and how people view those events differently long after they have happened, are proof of that. This is the cycle of history. We look to the past with a new lens, with new information, with new hindsight, and we try to piece together as many broken threads together as we can. Sometimes, parts of it are perfect. Sometimes, parts of it are not. Most importantly though, every part of it has been affected in some way by narrative control. So that brings me to my final layer, layer number three, which I'm going to refer to as the under the surface layer. In this layer, I'm going to talk about the very core of the game, the innermost part of it, the part that's most pungent, most stinging. This layer is meant to show just what exactly is affected by the powerful forces of narrative control. The name of this layer is a bit misleading though, because this isn't to say that the issues I'm going to talk about aren't directly commented on, or that they aren't integral to the story, or that they're invisible. Rather, I call this layer the under the surface layer because the issues I'm about to bring up are not about those who control the narrative, but rather those who are controlled by it. These people are the ones who are glossed over by history. These people are the ones who don't have narrative control, and therefore are left out of the narrative. And this is why we must dig them out from under the surface. For starters, the setting of the game is extremely important here. Everything that has to do with reading and writing, such as script writing, books, the printing press, and so on and so forth, are crucial to creating and maintaining narratives so the fact that many of the peasants are illiterate, or simply lack access to education or resources for books or writing, is massive. If the peasants do not have access to these tools of narrative control, then they cannot contribute to it. At least, not to the degree that those who are privileged can. And while oral traditions and oral history exist, there's a certain ephemeral nature to these stories. They don't have the near permanence of written history. This notion is addressed in the game, as old Peter is the last person remaining from his generation that seems to remember stories and traditions of the past. Stories that weren't written or kept. Stories that were forgotten by all except him. And it will remain that way unless Magdalene immortalizes his stories in her mural. And it's moments like this where you realize that the peasants are severely disadvantaged in the game of narrative control, much like in other aspects of their lives. If old Peter wishes to maintain all those narratives from the past, he has to rely on others for help. Pentiment is a story that highlights the lives of those who cannot control their own narratives. Peasants who try desperately at every turn to have some agency over their lives, but other actors end up exploiting and manipulating them. They're abused and controlled by others all throughout this story, whether that's because they're subject to unjust laws or guided by the nefarious thread puller, they simply lack the power to enact meaningful change. And this extends to the women in this story too. At the beginning of the game, Sister Illuminata reminds Andreas how she didn't have a choice in her vocation, truthfully noting that few women have that power. She also reminds Andreas about how women are portrayed by society. 
She reminds him of the narrative imposed upon women, that they're portrayed as vehicles of sin, and she expertly defends her point with several examples, such as how women and abbeys are forced to travel in pairs, lest they tempt the priests. From the very beginning of the game, Sister Illuminata lays out the consequences of narrative control. Women, just like peasants, can never be the protagonists of their own stories, and they're used as mere tools in the tales of men. Sister Illuminata isn't the only woman in this game who recognizes this either. Her astute feelings are actually an extremely key feature of this game's story. Several nuns throughout the game express their discontent with their work and being forced and guided into the vocation, and Magdalene even tries her best to convince one of the villagers against joining the convent. But to cap things off, narrative control ultimately comes down to this. Those who have the power to exert their influence over others can change the fates of all those involved in a given story precisely because of their narrative control. And with that revelation, this brings us to the end of this layered onion of narrative control and the central role it plays in Pentiment. Pentiment isn't a perfect game, but it's certainly one with an expertly crafted theme and narrative that's memorable long after finishing it. Because what it reveals to us isn't some distant, unknown, or even fictional past. It prompts us to consider how narrative control exists in our lives. By pairing the game's narrative control-focused story with the player's narrative control-focused actions, Pentiment reminds us that we all take part in narrative control in our own reality too, not just in this game. It reminds us to consider what has been changed in our shared histories and narratives as people. Who has been left out of these narratives? Who controls these narratives? And how will we write our own stories? What will we personally contribute to this unreliable chronicle of humanity? Whatever it is that shapes our past, present, and future, Pentiment tells us one thing. Life is like a painting, and if we look deeper and closer at the intricate details of our lives, we can see all the little strokes that made us into who we are today. If you enjoy this video essay, don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more content similar to this. I make videos about all things writing related. I'd also like to thank my patron, Edith Lopez Torres, for helping make this video happen. If you'd like to support me further, please check out my Patreon. I'll leave a link down in the description below. And if you've got some time, check out some of my other videos too. I really appreciate you watching this one. And to everyone who made it to the end here, thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.